Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Amy. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Bob Nickman from the Exploding Human Podcast with Bob Nickman. And this is the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, 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 it is. We are at Il Forno over in Santa Monica, and Brenda's riding with me. And uh, we're having a good time. And Brenda is on her phone playing the, the you playing solitaire. That's pretty sweet. And Bob Nickman is here. Bob Nickman is not just a podcast host from the Exploding Human podcast, but he's also you know, one of them fancy Hollywood writers. Oh, yeah. A comedian. So fancy. <laughs> <laughs> a comedian, someone that I enjoy, who, uh, his company are actually working on a project together that maybe we'll talk about. But um, just wanted you guys to all know that there's some incredible people out here that, that you may or may not ever get a chance to meet. And that's one of the things that is great about doing these podcasts is we can sit here in a lovely little cafe on a sunny afternoon on a Friday, uh, not be in traffic because the 405 is probably fucked right now. But uh, have a great conversation. So I want to just talk to the folks, especially all over the world, because we got people in Sweden and Germany and Japan and Australia, New Zealand, Hi Cat. Uh, all kinds of people that are listening. I'm not waving over there. Oh, okay. I thought maybe you saw an actual cat. <laughs> no, oh. there's a cat. Cat Connor is a writer oh, okay. of novels, and she oh. lives in New Zealand. And oh, so okay. she often plays us in her bookstore while she's working throughout the day. Oh, hi, cat. Yeah. With K-A-T, I'm assuming. A C. A C. Really? Cat oh, Connor. Okay. Yeah, oh, but with all Cs. Anyhow, so we've met so many incredible people and had so many opportunities. I just love to have these conversations. It's just, it's great. And uh, you and I could talk about anything, but what strikes your fancy right now? Oh, man, I just, you know, uh, happy to be alive. Let's put it that way. Had a lot of death in my life this year, Ugh. last past year. I, don't, I didn't even think I was going to talk about that, but I've been, I've been thinking about a, a number of people that have passed away in the last few days, yeah. and I haven't talked about it with anybody, and it just uh, popped out of my brain. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, uh, I just want to say I miss them. <laughs> yeah. Them, and I'm saying them because there's like five people. Golly. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of circles of, uh, of contact? Are we talking close family? Well, my father friends? is probably the big one. In the last five days? No, the last, the last recently. Okay. I had about five people in the last six months. Oh, wow. Okay, you know? so your, your pop, he passed yeah. along? That was, you know, an interesting thing because I was talking to somebody else about it, um, how uh, he was ready, and he mm-hmm. was ready for a number of years. So when he passed, there was a huge relief because mm. he was kind of he was sick, you know, yeah. and and not feeling well for a long time. He had Parkinson's and yeah. a number of things. And he used to say to me, you know, uh, I'm done, but I'm not sick enough to die. I'm not well enough to to enjoy my life. Yeah. And it wasn't even morbid. It was just sort of I'm stuck. He was just frustrated. Yeah. It was it was a it was a, it was hard to watch, but I was I was very relieved. In a, in a sense, w- when it happened, and it was quite beautiful that he, you know, led, led such a long life. He was 95. Right. Yeah, there's like the different categories of death, and I often ask, like, was it, was it you know, a surprise? Was it a shock? Or was it relief? You know, because the surprise is like, you were alive, and then poof, you're dead. The shock is like, we knew he wasn't doing well, yeah. and then poof, he was dead. And then there's the, it's good. You know, yeah. it's, it's, there's that was relief. that was that was what you'd kind of hope for, other than the long the long yeah. sort of deterioration, yeah. which was a number of years. And then I lost a, a close friend who was a comedian that I'd known for thirty years. Mm. That was a surprise. Yeah, it wasn't sudden, but it was fast. It was yeah. uh, liver cancer, and by the time he told me, till the time he died, it was less than two months. Yeah, so it was fast. Yeah. Yeah, those kind of, those, and that's exactly right. That's the shocking kind where you're just like, he, he was, he had a cold in February, and then he went and saw the doctor, and then he was dead. Like just like, bam. Yeah. Does that stuff put you in a depressed state at all? Are you are you prone towards depression or? Uh, I'm prone towards uh, hopelessness. He laughs dramatically. And futility. Yeah. Um, well, I'm laughing about it because I don't indulge it. Yeah, I, I yeah, have yeah. in the past when I was younger. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it was sort of a. There, there's a great line. Did you ever see the movie Barfly? 
Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. God, way back. Yeah, it was written by Charles Bukowski. Yeah. And it was you know not kind of autobiographical. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's a line in there where the a guy's you know he's the the lead character that's kind of him says, humanity, you never had it from the beginning. <laughs> And I remember <laughs> jumping out of my seat when I saw that. I go, that's it. That guy mm-hmm. nailed it. <laughs> yeah. And that was my worldview for a really long time. And it still is to a degree. There's a there's a feeling that I get a lot of the times of, mm. what is this? It's just this giant failed experiment. Yeah. Do I have a lot of joy in my life? I do. And I try to seek more of that because I see the how short it is and how ephemeral and all those yeah. kinds of things. But left to not working on myself, that's where I go. That's uh, interesting. And I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And gosh, we can branch off so many different ways here. But I'm going to take the conversation for right now and, and go in this direction. That one, So I struggle with PTSD and I got a group that I go to. We're all a bunch of veterans. And just, you know, a lot, I always tell my, my therapist, I'm like, you know, some of this stuff I know is just life. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, you've got other things. Like, you know, you get triggered in a certain way because there's been – a high threat area has been my norm for so long. I can walk around in a high threat state and handle it. It's like, that means when there's low threat, like you have problems getting everything chemically back into your balance. So yeah, you can react to it, but, but now you have all these different chemicals balanced out in a way to respond to that. And so for me, like my body wants to go to that state. It's almost like it's natural thing. So I do get depressed because I'm used to being up. And then I get down and I get uh, not hopelessness, but like a sense of like pen- impending doom. Yeah. Dread. Something, something really bad's about to happen because that's what my brain is thinking all the time. It's like, no, something bad's going to happen. Be ready. Be ready. And uh, I can freak myself out. Oh, I got to be really careful about my thoughts. Yeah. I mean, the, to me, life is all about thought management. Okay. Whether you're have had trauma such as you've had or or just moving through life, if you're not mindful and managing your thoughts in some way yeah it's it's really it's really easy to go down the rabbit hole and fast i i I remember the first time i really freaked myself out young i was (laughs) young i was driving in the car uh with my mother i was probably about nine right and i'm looking at her and she's driving yeah and and my mother was a very sweet woman who you know cared about me it wasn't anything like there was no insanity or any of that kind of stuff. And I'm looking at her and I'm <laughs> and I'm and I start to think, what is going on behind her eyes inside of her brain? Yeah. What is the what is the what is the governor on someone's brain, hers in particular at this moment, that's keeping her from swerving the car and crashing it? Right. Or stopping the car and choking me. <laughs> and 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 yeah, I didn't have any of that in my life. Right, I didn't right, have right. the, but I just started to go. There's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing that stops a human being other than who knows what it is. Right. And I'm in danger. Yes. She's crazy. I started. Right. I, I started to talk myself, and she, and I, I, I scared myself. Yeah. I, I remember sort of rolling down the window and sticking my head out and trying to, you know, deep breathe. Nine years old. Yeah, and, yeah. And I had oh no, I had no reason to be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> No, absolutely. It's like when you look at the airplane door and you think anybody could open. In reality, you can't. Yeah. But you think anybody <laughs> yeah, can grab that this thing. Like I rely on everybody to. Keep, so I have those kind of thoughts, not commonly, but um, yeah, you can definitely get yourself riled up and, and going in the wrong direction. I was thinking too about one of the things about having a gun in a place where you need a gun is you think you always need a gun, and I've worked like I, I still want to be in that zone. Also, because I'm a spy. I'm always looking for threat, 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 threat. Where's the threat? Where's the threat? Where's the threat? And I just, I, I know a lot of my people make their money doing that and I would rather be broke, which I am, but um, <laughs> I'd rather be broke than live in that threat based world. Like, yeah, I can go get a job with a contractor looking for threat, but I don't want to fill my brain with that. I've seen enough dead people, you know, that's a good choice. Right. Well, yeah. and so that brings me to the reason why I wanted to kind of take is you said something cool is you're talking about joy and everything. And, and I, I commonly say, like, I like to collect joy, whether it's my own, like, being with my daughter, and I love it. Sometimes she frustrates the shit out of me, but mostly, like, she brings me such wonderful joy. Like, I just, I love to be around her. Uh, the other day, I throat punched myself on accident, and we laughed five minutes about that, and it was just great. So, that's a, that's a joy moment. I collect that, and then I ask people often, like, 
When was the last time, Bob, that you has had just absolutely unbridled, overwhelming joy? Oh, man, that's the hard question. <laughs> right? But if I said, when was the last time you were pissed or angry or just frustrated oh, as shit? Yeah. Right. It's so easy. So I try to force myself, especially like when I feel like the impending doom thing or like when I reset and do my mindful pause, I think, when was the last time I had joy? And it, it, it makes me remember, oh, that's right. The other day I throat punched myself on accident and it was hilarious. And we just had this moment that wasn't just funny, but it was us infectiously laughing. Right. You know? There was a... The- in the middle of that sort of absurdity, mm-hmm. there was a love connection between two yes. people. Of like, boy, is life absurd and fun and yeah. just like, what was that? Yeah. I, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a feeling that, I mean, life is hard, as you know, from the last recent past, losing five different people in your life. You know, as soon as you think it's going to be easy, there's there's a curveball coming, you know, whether, whether it's dropping your keys and you're just like, fuck, I just, I, I, and like, all you do is drop them. You know, individually, it's no big deal. But when it's like another thing on your back, it's so crazy. I feel like we're so hard on ourselves politically, especially like right now. And I don't know if that's any different than any of the time in history because we're really bad at keeping that in perspective. But we're just so hard on ourselves here in America with like what we expect us to have and do. Like, honestly, it's really fucking nice here. You know, and all you have to do is go somewhere else and go. Wow. Well, that's that really is an interesting thing. How uh, a country that has so much to offer, yeah, and so much uh, ease and uh, pleasure, and even free time, and certainly not a constant. You know, bombs aren't dropping, and right. all, any none of that stuff that goes on all over the world, and uh, and then. You become, I think, as a country, you, it's like a, 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 a an entitled uh, rich kid who gets <laughs> who's miserable because yeah. it's never enough. Never enough because they have so much. Mm-hmm. And I and I think travel is a is a huge thing to to solve world problems. Yeah. I think if people see other people and how they live and get to meet them and see that they're not different, right? They might look different, they might talk different, but they're not really different. No, for sure. And I think that sett- that would settle a lot of problems. There's a lot of folks that just, and I'll use President Trump, just because he's so divisive. And, and this isn't an endorsement of him. It just He creates so much animosity that ha- over half of us are always going to be in a rage. And that's just no way to live. Yes, of course there's problems. No country's perfect. But everybody has the opportunity here. And if they don't, there's a lot of people that want to give them the opportunity. You know, there's, it just really isn't that bad. And then if it's so bad, why is it better than it was 20 years ago? And we can argue, okay, 20 years ago, it wasn't really, okay, fine. Go back 40 years ago. Now it's the, the late 70s. I'm positive it's better now than it was back then. I mean, you look at how it was, how life was in big cities and everything else, you know, we're 10 years removed from like the end of the civil rights movement and all that stuff. And there's still a lot of anger. The N word wasn't the N word. It was actually just said, you know? Oh yeah. Openly, I was, I was thinking time. about late sixties and all this, you know, there yeah. was, it was, a, our country was really violent mm-hmm. mid yeah. to mid, mid sixties to late early and early seventies. Yeah. I mean, now there was back craziness that. that was going on. It's not, I mean, it's their stuff now, but it was just as right. Just as insane. And go back, you know, another 20 or 30 years, and all of a sudden you're in World War II and Korea and all these different conflicts that were, you know, and the Cold War and all these other things. It's really, really, we've done a lot. Yeah. We had a, a guest on the other day. He's got a great brand. He, uh, C SPAN paid him to go around to all of the First Lady places, things, events, histories and grab it. And so he became the First Lady's man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Great <Just> title. <laughs> clever as hell. Yeah. And one of the things he's like, yeah, you think about where we are in the world. You know, Woodrow Wilson was president until he basically had the stroke that shut him down and his wife took over before she was even allowed to vote. She's, in effect, the president of the United States. That's amazing. And like, yeah, you know what? We've come a long way and we were doing good back then, you know, like to be able to have that happen. So, yeah, I think we're just too hard on ourselves politically. Not that it's not important to always advance, but we do. Yeah. We're also hard on ourselves in a million other ways, too. Boy. You know, we work way too hard. Yeah. Yeah. Your boss will gladly buy you lunch if you sit at your desk and keep working. Yeah. 
<laughs> and you know what? I we'll mean, gladly do it. I mean, I love these countries. They shut down for a couple hours in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. makes so much. Like, what are we doing? You know, race to nowhere is, yeah. uh, you know, a phrase I always liked because it just makes it makes sense to me. Yeah. I like, I think just biologically, I like to take a nap. I've always oh, been too. that guy since I was a kid. Yeah. I'm not allowed to now. Yeah. It's considered laziness or <laughs> or yeah. s- sloth. Sloth. Or you know, you're not yeah. you're not working hard enough. You're not striving to do what? Yeah. I have to tell myself to stop working after ten o'clock at night. Because I'll keep editing. Because if I edit now, I'll have less to do tomorrow. Even though the next day I'll edit till ten at night, you know? And I, I also am a napper, especially now in a combat zone, I get to call my shots a lot more. And I haven't done that work in a while, but but I will take a nap. And if anybody's got a problem, they're, I will always say, you've got a problem with me taking a nap? Grab your rucksack. Do a day with me. You let me know. Mm-hmm. You know, And that shuts everybody up. They're like, yeah, you're right. Never mind. Shut up. But they've never, they've never taken the challenge because no one wants to. But you're right. I, there is the perception for those that apparently you know, look down upon it. But it, it's what clears my brain. I come back with new ideas. Yeah, naps are awesome. But it's not accepted by a I, lot I of people. I just think like at the end, am I going to go... Oh man, I should have I should have worked, you know, much more hours. Or am I going to say I wish I would have enjoyed myself more? <laughs> right. I think it's the second one. No, it for sure is the second one. U two's got an album out, and the audience is like, "Oh Jesus, Pete's talking about U two again." But the thing is, the songs of experience is what the album's about. And it's like, what is the middle aged man telling his younger self and everything else? Like, what's the last song that you would like to sing? What would it be about? You know, quit being so afraid. Like if I could go back and tell my younger self, like quit being so afraid, create something. So what if no one likes it? Create it. Go do that and and make that part of your path is build new creative creation things. And, and not everybody's a creator like we are, but whatever that thing is, those chances, take them. So if you have to work harder, okay, now you're working harder for yourself. You're investing in yourself instead of 12 hour days for your boss and your boss can be like yeah not good enough <laughs> sorry right. yeah yeah what well, go ahead oh, I was just going to say that the underlying issue of all of it is fear yeah and I always have to ask myself well why what am I afraid of and what if that actually happened then what would happen then what would happen then what yeah. would happen? and it always comes down to this irrational fear is I'll be destroyed yeah in some way you know, if I if I ask for, you know, this thing to because I want to do if I want to do, you know, X and I ask for Y to get there and they, mm-hmm. I say no, I'll feel bad. Then I'll be worthless. Then I'll be destroyed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or is it just a thing that happens and I'll go, all right, that's done. I'll go to the next thing. Right. You know, uh, and then if you took the things that have actually happened in your life like losing five people in a very short amount of time, you'd be like, that would destroy me. And yet here you are, you know, dealing with it. I mean, the things, the hardest things in your life, you, you would terrify your younger self if you said, this is coming. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but we borrow all this trouble. That's the thing I, I try not to do is uh, I try not to borrow trouble. And and like you, especially in combat, like oh, I'm going to shut down and go to bed. I need rest. I'm listening to myself. And then if anybody has anything to say, I'm like, I promise the war will still be here tomorrow when I wake up. Nothing I'm doing is like lights out. It's over. Yeah. I wonder how much this need for people to feel important is part of that kind of drive to overdo Mm. it. It's like if I stop and I don't do it, does that mean I'm really not as important as I think I am and as I think I need to be? (laughs) I wonder if that's a piece of it because it seems like it might be, you know, Uh, you know, do I feel more important when I'm super like busy or am I having these unpleasant thoughts that I want to distract myself right. by being, by overworking or, you know, cause, uh, it's hard to know. Cause I, I, I kind of jump around from, from different things, you know, it's, uh, I, I, the last night I was working on, a, I'm helping this friend of mine with a script and I'm giving him notes and I'm doing little rewrites in there and really, you know, and I was very close to the end. I was about... 10 pages from the end and I was kind of tired and I was like you know I'm going to power through this I'm going to finish it and send it to him and then I said no I'm not I'll get up tomorrow and I'll do it and I got up this morning and I didn't feel like doing it I wanted to work out that was (laughs) more important to me and then when I got back I had to do something else and then I came to do this yeah it's still there yeah I'll, I'll finish it tonight or tomorrow 
and it's going to make any difference that I waited two days. Yeah, only you make that difference. And if your friend's holding it against you, you got to be like, you know what? No, he's like, man, you do this stuff fast. He's always like, this is great. <laughs> yeah, right. Because everybody else, they take forever. Yeah. He goes, you do it in like three days. <laughs> so I was having a, a pretty – my bouts of depression are a lot more manageable now because I've got more tools uh, now that I've got some help. But I was having a pretty bad bout of depression a while ago. And uh, it ties to a bunch of things. But one is like struggling to try to figure all this out and make money and everything. And money causes everybody stress. But I was telling Mark, I'm like, Mark Valley uh, is an actor. You probably heard of him. And he used to be part of the show. He does his own podcast. He's in Africa right now filming a thing. It's really cool. But uh, I'm like, you know, I, I, I know I said I was going to do this for you, but I just can't seem to get it done. And, and I'm a better friend than that. But I, he's like, oh, you're a fellow depressed guy. Well, let me just tell you, you are producing a lot of stuff. I, I see what you're doing. I know you're doing it. You may not feel like you're getting enough done, but you're getting a lot done. And, and I'm going to be fine. You're going to be fine. You know? And sometimes you just need to hear that from someone yeah. else who's like, man, I've been there. And you'd be surprised at what you're actually doing. You know, And even if it's just getting through the day for me, and I haven't had those kind of days in a while, but if you're in that state and you're listening and you're like, no, the bed is as far as I can get today, you know, that's. That's fine. You can put the bar that you have to get over right on the ground and just walk right over it and be like, I got over the bar today. And then next day, maybe lift it an inch. Maybe not. But start to work on, you know, get out of the house for 10 minutes. Put some sunshine on your face or whatever it is. Because uh, having five family members die or five people close to you yeah. dies is, is rough. You know, it's uh, I, I still think a part of me detached a little bit for the survival piece of it, mm -hmm. you know, because it, sometimes it comes to me and it'll hit me. Yeah. When I'm least thinking about it and I'll like, you know, the other day I was just thinking about my dad and I was just seeing, seeing him and thinking about all the good stuff he gave me and maybe conflicts that I had with him. And, you know, in the end, none of that mattered. It was all just love, which was, which was really, you know, a great thing to, to be able to just, and to tell my friend that too, as he was dying and we both knew it, it was, that it was coming and that. Each yeah. time we would talk, that's what it, that's I love you, which is you know for a couple of he men like us. <laughs> <laughs> there is something with that, and to have that pleasure, and I'll call it that because it really is. You you are enjoying the last few visits with your friend ever, and a lot of that time is spent just in silent communication where you don't have to say anything. Just I just want to be here with you, you know, and. There's a real, I think there's a joy in that, you know, if you have the luxury of knowing that the end is nigh, you know, you can, you want to spend it with people like that. Yeah. I, I remember reading about this, uh, I guess it was a Buddhist thing. It was, uh, they were talking about if life is like a smooth lake mm. and somebody dies um, and you throw a stone into the lake representing that person. Now, the more important and impactful the bigger the boulder, mm -hmm. you know, now it's a big boulder creating a lot of waves and ripples that last a longer time, or maybe it's a little pebble, of yeah. somebody who's not that much of an impact on other people. But very, very, very quickly, that lake smooths over and becomes the smooth lake again. So what is, what is the importance, you know, it's really just about going back into the, into the, whatever that is, yeah. you know, that, that place we come from or are already in just in a different way so I, I always love that analogy it's like how how important right yeah is anybody really that way i mean we're we're, we're all sort of equally important in perspective to the lake the pebble and the boulder to me are not all that different they aren't they're really not different at all because who's scoring the waves well, uh, other rocks and pebbles. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah whatever it, you know it's good that you did that, and you'll be dead longer than you were alive really fast. I know, and it lasts a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, that's just how it is. And so what do you want to do? You want to focus on the game over moment? No. And what you got? Or do you want to focus on sitting next to your daughter and, you know, just trying to enjoy those moments? Well, that's, that's why I like that, to, that you talk about the importance of joy because it's, a, it's, it's been the biggest challenge for me. and. Mm -hmm. I think it's courageous to 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 say it out loud and to pursue it because there's a lot of um, people that don't. I don't know if they're afraid of it or they don't know what it is or it's a threat, 
or it's so elusive I think that they it's don't easier say it. To do the other thing. It is. It is because what if I say, "Oh, I want to be joyful," and I'm not? Ah, you failed. <laughs> you failed, sir. <laughs> You suck at being joyful. I yeah. know. Oh, I'm <laughs> shitty. Yeah. Well, that's kind of one of the reasons I st- I'm going to bring it to myself here yeah. and my podcast. Please. Why I st- started doing the Exploding Human, which is about health, healing, mind, uh, mind body, and spirit. And I talk to a lot of different um, practitioners, alternative healers, and people who've overcome challenges. Right. And it's really about making life better for other people. And I started doing this because many years ago uh, as I started to get healthier I used to drink a lot and do some other stuff and uh, when I stripped that away and I was standing there going now what do I do with my time yeah. and what kind of life do I want to lead I started to explore a variety of things from uh, you know spiritual to uh, physical yes. to emotional yeah. so therapy and different types of you know uh, and exercise and food so I started to and I didn't know really where to go yeah. for that stuff. So I thought, well, boy, that, I, I'm, gonna, I'm doing the podcast that I like, would have liked to have existed right. back when I started doing that stuff. So I've had some pretty cool guests, you being one of them. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Scott Husing was on at the same time. We talked about PTSD and suicide and those things. And, yeah, it is powerful. And when it comes to veterans in general, you know, as we get to the end of our rope, we're so damn stubborn and, you know, have to be tough all the time. That uh, we always think that someone else has less rope than us, so help them first. And then you get to the point where you're so poisoned against your own longevity that it's easier just to flip the switch, you know? Mm. And it's uh, it's a big problem because at some point you just don't fear. You don't want to continue. You know, it's been bad for so long. There's no way out. And it's hard. You know, who's got any right to tell that person otherwise? It's, you could try, but that's an awful big ask. Well, the mind is so powerful, too, yeah. you, to get in there and try to talk to. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Well, the mind is so powerful, too. Yeah. You, to get in there and try to talk to talk somebody into thinking a different way yeah. when they don't want it yeah. and they don't want to hear it or they're not ready, is it's impossible. And for some people, it's always been impossible. They were just never going to have a long life just because of, I mean, I'm Definitely believe we've had um, some geneticists on the show, like the genetic link to who we are. It's only getting stronger. We're only getting a better understanding of just how, you know, your makeup, I'm, I'm making a motion that has nothing to do with anything, but, but uh, <laughs> plus no one can see it. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, listening. <laughs> your combination of genes, which slightly change over time too, you've got no control over that. You just get to deal with the outcome of, of how, how you respond to a given situation. And, uh, I think that's going to change how we look at certain things. And I'll even go on record and say it could be that at some point suicide is not suicide. It's just, you know, the termination of of this life or whatever it is, you know, and it, it turns out to be a, a set of a moment of weakness. It's a moment of enlightenment or whatever, however we want to change it, you know, like the person like your dad who's sick and spiraling. And it's like, you know, that person gets the dignity of saying, What's the point of me being, and I'm not, it's not your dad's case in particular, but there are a lot of older people that lose consciousness and just kind of cruise out for however many weeks or months. What's the point? You know, if that person is like, once I, at this point, any point after that, I'm good. We should be able to, I think we will, give that person the relief that they need. And the family too. I mean, how hard is that on a family, you know? Yeah. You take three months off from work waiting for your dad to die and he doesn't die. Well, that happens a lot. Right. I mean, you know, the interesting thing was um, my dad was pretty pretty sick for a long time, and my mom wasn't. All right. Uh, she she had eyesight issues as she got older, so he was kind of her eyes, and she was his caregiver in these other ways. And it was a really good team in terms of aging. Yeah. And then my mom broke her hip, and she died 
un, you know, it was not expected that that was happening. And there he was, the guy that we thought was going to go first was didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Three and a half years later, yes, but he had that three and a half years. Yeah. Uh, not really wanting to do it anymore. Yeah. He was he was done. And and, and that that gets to be okay. Like he can say that, that's me that just died. So in effect. I'm what's left of what's dead, and yeah, I don't want to do it. I had an interesting conversation with him about it because he'd say, uh, you know, uh, that he was. He goes, "I'm not afraid to be dead." Mm-hmm. He goes, "But I'm really afraid of the the dying process." Hmm. And I go, "What part of it?" He goes, "I think it's going to hurt." I go, "Well, you're not in pain now. Yeah. What evidence do you have that it's going to hurt?" Maybe it'll be unbelievably peaceful. You don't really know. He's just like, yeah. I mean, he just kind of mumbled. It was like, <laughs> it, but it was yeah. an interesting thing. He was so afraid of that pro- yeah. of that process. Uh, you know where he got that thinking. I don't really know. Yeah, it's and not unreasonable. It, I mean, it's a it's a valid. No. You know, it, and it turned out that you know my take on it was actually what happened, not right. the painful thing. Right. But there's certainly no guarantee. No. And again, no. like being able to say, you know, I think on this date, that'll be it. And then if he's like, eh, change my mind, I'll keep going for a little while. Like they get to do that too. You know, I, I can just see that becoming more of a thing. I don't know. Maybe it won't, but it seems to make sense to me that uh, our thinking will evolve on that. Cause some people really just, it's un, it's cruel to continue to have them live in a way that, yeah, I mean, they have stuff now in place in California, but it's mm-hmm. only for people that right. are, are, you know, they're terminal and there's all these rules and you got to do it right. a certain way. It's just, you know, not that I, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people probably just go ahead and do that when they're sick and they don't go through any of that. And they just, right. we just don't, we just yeah, don't know about, about it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that's heavy. Yeah, did you think this was going to go this way? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I never know which way they're going to go. Let me ask you this. Do you meditate? I meditate, yeah. I meditate every day. Yeah, me I, too. I don't do big orchestrated meditation because I don't do it. Um, and I mean like I just – I mean to. I just don't. So what I do is I take micro meditations throughout the day. Like I just try to reset mentally. And if I can do it longer, I do. But um, my nap is part of that. Like I get to nap because that's well-being. And, mm-hmm. and so I start by just by meditate and I can fall asleep an instant. So I try to stay awake a little longer, but yeah, at a red light, uh, anywhere, you know, I just, I take a moment to just do a little bit. And then if I think of it, yeah, I'm not afraid to spend 10, 15 minutes in a zone. Meditating. Can, you, can you imagine if they had taught that in school? Boy, or, you know, it's not even really teach. It's just sort of. Mm-hmm. show that as an option. It, well, that never came up one time. Yeah. yeah. I always think about how uh, how many valuable things I had to learn on my own. <laughs> that school would have been a great place to introduce these that things. That sounds like Brenna talking. Like, they didn't teach us stuff that we need to know. Well, you certainly. Know? You know, uh, just basic, you know, car maintenance, mm-hmm. uh, how, to, how to save money. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, how to buy a house. Right. Things that everyone kind of has to do. How to get a job. How to get a job. How to shake hands. Oh, my gosh. A lot of people don't know how to shake hands. Yeah. Yeah. Who's I got taught my kids that. that. I, Did you? I, yeah. We had sort of, you what, know, fun what's, classes. What's your uh, What's your basic class for how to shake hands? Um, a firm handshake. Look the person in the eye. Okay. And smile. What's a firm handshake? Let me shake your hand. Uh, this is what I think is a firm handshake. I've given you a solid hand, but yeah. I'm not trying to right, crush not, you. Right. The crushing ones are kind of weird. That's yeah. like a dominance thing or something right, that people right. do. Um, because there's people all, all over the world that will give you a much more dainty. You know? Yeah, or they'll put the thumb inside so you're holding their entire <laughs> <laughs> like a dead fish. Yeah. I'm like, who taught you how to shake hands? But that is a first impression right. of confidence, of somebody that likes themselves, that's somebody that's connecting. Yeah. It's a really simple thing to teach a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Look so, them in the eye, shake I, their hands. Yeah, so. I never had handshaking classes. Right, right. Um, yeah, there's in, in this my thing. house, but I taught my kids that way. There's there are like things that we find important. Two classes, <laughs> two and classes then lo- they got. They a graduate. lot of spanking for reinforcement. <laughs> <laughs> you did it wrong, right, Brenna? That's how we do it. She gets a whooping and a yelling at. Um, and also, um, goal setting. Okay. 
hitting, you know, how, how do you accomplish things in your life? They don't mm-hmm. teach those basic yeah. skills. You know, a lot of people go, well, I want, oh, this is an interesting thing. Yes. A friend of mine has a friend who's a school teacher who's a middle school teacher, and he asked his students, do you have enough power there? In the yeah, thing? we're good. He asked his students to um, what they wanted to be when they grew up. Okay. Take a guess what the number one answer was of middle schoolers. Uh, musician. Okay. I'm going to give you a shot at video games. something like video games. Something with video games. Okay, this is this blew me away as it did him. This is what they wanted to be, famous. Oh, okay, just famous. Yeah, just famous. And he said, "For what? We don't care. We just want to be famous." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How? Uh, I don't know. That made me sad. I but, just felt like, wow, is that that's an actual career? Is yeah. fame? <laughs> I mean, this is the thing, like. Brenna and I kind of had this conversation the other day because she's she's still figuring it out. She's twenty one, you know, and there's there's forty more years of still figuring it out ahead of her, and that's okay. But when you graduate from high school, if you said I want you to make a list of every single career you can think of, that number that's going to be on that page, it's not fifty, you know, it's going to be thirty three, you know, nurse, doctor, firefighter, policeman, banker, teacher. Fuck, it's getting hard. Engineer, both kinds, you know, <laughs> like, train and uh, yeah, yeah, and math, civil, yeah, train and civil, right? <laughs> and I think we're selling ourselves short because first off, we all know that we're unhappy and work a day lives. Some people are great at that and they want to grind and all that kind of thing, and that's their happy place. That's always available to you, but there's so many other people that want to do something else. Like we're taught that oh, don't get a degree in music, you can't make any money in that. You can't. You can go to Vegas four hours away, and if you can play the fuck out of something, you can make money in that town, standing on a goddamn corner, mm-hmm. you know? You can absolutely make music. Um, maybe you do that and you sell drug <laughs> pharmaceuticals during the day, yeah. you know, and then you go play a jazz gig at night until that happens, or it's just your side gig. There's a guy that plays the keys uh, a couple nights a week at the Golden Steer. It's one of my favorite places to eat in Vegas. It's a steakhouse. And, you know, like, who knows? Like, that's a guy. He probably gets paid. A couple hundred bucks a night when he does it. There's a zillion things you can do, but we don't let anybody know that there's a zillion things. And most everybody, and I'm going to ask you, this is my long, circuitous question to you. Most people our age, any age over above like 35, and you say, is this what you thought you were going to be? And how did you get here? They're all like, I have no fucking idea. I, I didn't know I would be here. It all makes sense in the rearview mirror, but it would be great to help people see that, like, worry less about the path and worry more about just what you do along the path. Well, yeah. And none of the things I've done were presented to me as possibilities. Right. None of them. Hmm. Not one of them. You didn't go to school to become a a Hollywood writer? No, I did not. (laughs) Who goes to school for that? For, you know, you don't really do that or, you know, and that was, that's career number three. Right. Okay. That's career number three. Um, of varying degrees of success in the different ones. Yeah. But, you know, I started out, I went to, you know, I went to college I, for nothing, you know, just every, you know, general studies, I guess they called it. And while I was there, I, st- you know, I was always into blues music and I started to play the harmonica. It's just a hobby. And then I got obsessed with it. Okay. And I practiced and I practiced and I met these guys and I started to play in bands and I made, that was my first career. I didn't, I just started doing it and yeah. I was, I was living on almost nothing. I was in my early twenties. I didn't you need a lot. You were broke in your early 20s? I'm looking at Brenner right now. I was, yes, I, I was, you know, living on maybe, at the time, in the early 70s, mm-hmm. I was maybe living on $150 a week. Wow. Uh, which was, you know, I don't know what that would be now, 300 maybe? Well, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's 500 bucks. But it was, in, you know, it was in Ohio. It wasn't expensive. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. you know, I didn't need that much, you know, because yeah. I was pursuing something that I really cared about. And then I segued a comedy club opened in the town I was in, in Columbus, Ohio. I said, I want to try that. Yeah. Now. I was doing both for a little while. And I went, oh, now there's actual work yeah. doing this. I can open up for real comedians. Yeah. As a open. new com- yeah, yeah. As a new comedian. Yeah. And travel around. I was already traveling a little bit. Right. So I started doing that. And I was making $250 a week. <laughs> and getting like some free, like I guess not wings back then. It would be like well, free grilled cheese sandwich every now and then. There and, was a lot of free things that sort of accompanied yeah. the nightclub life, but uh, and a lot of hazards. Yeah. So and and I 
eventually, you know, started making more and more money doing that. And I was making a pretty decent living. And I came out to Los Angeles and did that for a while and then segued into becoming a television writer. So none of that growing up in Ohio was on the radar. Not offered. No, uh, not offered and not explained and, and not to be expected. You know, and if anything, if you had said, I think I might like to go to Hollywood and write, you would have got a, a verbal beating from everybody you talked to. You know? Well, I did. I mean, <laughs> it was like, I, I actually had a, a, my dad, again, I had a conversation with mm -hmm. him. He said, I'm sorry if I disparage the things you were doing and discourage, try to discourage you. He goes, yeah. but I was really afraid for you because I would have been afraid. Right. Pretty enlightened thing to say. Yeah. Very kind. And, you know, after the fact of like, what are you doing? <laughs> right. Yeah. I was telling, you know, as I try to pass these lessons on to my daughter. And uh, she's sitting next to me right now. We were talking as we were we got detoured through downtown Santa Monica, which is always a good thing. Though at the time I got frustrated by it. <laughs> but it's actually wonderful always. to drive around. And I was like, you should do something like this. Come here, live here, be poor, and just live in Santa Monica. And whatever you do, you're doing here. Because that's a wonderful thing to do. you know, Or Tahoe or whatever. Pick a place where people go to vacation and make that the place where you do whatever it is that you do. Even if it's pharmaceutical sales or whatever changing tires for people and then at night you grab that honer you know blues <laughs> you know blues harp b and you're like i only got like can we all play in the key of b that's right. all i got that's all i can afford well, you know this whole town is that it's people people that go you know what i'm gonna try mm -hmm. yeah the worst thing that could happen is it doesn't work out and you go do something else yeah but worse than that is not trying it being at the end going, I wish I would have tried that. Why didn't I take that chance? We've had so many elite level performers and, and just people that have done things at the highest level and, and not necessarily it's the top to level. <laughs> <laughs> no, you actually are, are part of that mix. But you take someone, anyone um, who, who didn't make that leap. You know, like we have Dexter Holland from Offspring, and he's got a PhD and everything else, and super smart. But he also is the lead singer of the Offspring. I mean, it's incredible. But the difference between him and the college band next to them is that they, you know, even from within their band, one of the guys is like, "This is all fun and everything. We're having a great time, but I'm just going to go be a pediatrician because there's a bunch of smart dudes. You know, they just happen to keep playing, and so." You know, like uh, Noodles, the guitar player, like he was a janitor at a school. He's like, I'm just going to make this money and then see how this band thing goes. And it just kept going. It kept going and going and going. And the difference between that guy and the other guy who plays guitar great in his garage is that something out of his control happened. You know, Noodles met the right guys at the right yeah. time. Uh, you know, the need for, for benefits and money for a kid you know, didn't come along for noodles or whoever that guy is. And they, they just, the path evolves differently for people. It's often way out of our control. I just got very grateful that my name isn't noodles. <laughs> <laughs> That's Brennan's nickname for a while. Well, like little kid, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's, how did he get the name noodles? Oh, he, who knows? Oh, okay. Just I give out nicknames a lot, but yeah, that, that step between getting to where they're at, oftentimes, I and mean, we've had a bunch of people say, I wasn't the best horn player or whatever. I'm just the guy that kept getting gigs. And something about that, you know, yeah, I practice and yeah, I'm excellent now, but there are guys that are better than me. I just kept doing it for whatever reason, you know? Yeah. Driven or luck or just I didn't know what else to do, you know, like those are all legitimate reasons to get down the road. I remember talking to this uh, friend of mine when I was moving out of Columbus to go. I forget where I was. I think I was going to Boston where wow. I, uh, to do stand-up. I was decided I was going to move there because I could make a living and not have to travel that much. And I told her what I was doing. And she, she just looked at me like completely puzzled. Yeah. She goes, I could never do that. And I, I, I go, what do you mean? Of course you could. Yeah. You, you just do it. You just do it. And she goes, no, I couldn't. I couldn't leave my my mom and my dad. And this is a almost, you know, 27-year-old right. person. I'm like, you come back, you know. There's planes. There's planes. <laughs> There's phones. They got trains. They got cars and gas, all that stuff. But she's probably right, though. She couldn't. Like, it's just right. insurmountable. Well, for her, that worked. 
And that's okay. I mean, I, I don't, you know, for me it didn't work, so I didn't do that. I'm not even saying she was right or wrong. I'm just saying it was just, that was the stronger uh, yeah. drive. There's the people in my life that started their thing when they were 18, 20, 21 years old. Maybe they didn't go to college, but they got that job. Let's say it was with the city. That's the easy one, right? You got a job with the city, and they started out, you know, part-time painting stop sign lines on the street, you know, and getting paid five eighty-five an hour. You know, maybe you're making seven twenty-six an hour. Before, you know, you're like, you working with the city, making that much money part-time? Why that? I'm going to college. And then, you know, five years later, they're like, no, I'm, I'm the guy that runs the guys that drive the truck. And then, you know, next thing you know, they're like, ah, you know, I'm the second in command at Parks and Rec. And then the next thing, you know, and, next, and now they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I've retired. I'm so, I, I met a guy left. like that yeah. at the UPS store the other day. He had, he had driven a big blue bus for the city of Santa Monica. <laughs> and then he became a, you know, supervisor. Right. And he was, uh, you know, he's retired for like 15 years already. And he was... Uh, Tell him about all the countries he travels to and wow. how, you know, how much he's enjoying his retirement. And I'm like, wow, maybe, <laughs> maybe I should have right. went that route. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, there was a comfort level to the, uh, I guess, the routine of having that steady. There was something like that. But maybe like, he loved it. I don't know. He seemed like, he seemed pretty content. Well, they, they figure out how to do that, right? Like, like, I don't know. I just kept doing it. It's the same thing as the horn blower. Like, I, I just kept doing it. I just kept showing up, and I put my name for stuff, and sometimes I said yes, sometimes I said no, you know, and 25 <laughs> years later, I'm like, I don't know if I have to do this anymore, and it's, it's you know, we don't have to be so afraid of, of those things that we, those decisions, you know, it's going to, we're going to figure it out. And I think that's probably the perfect way to go for certain people. Yeah. You know, uh, it wouldn't have been for me, but I think it's really kind of, Yeah, I, I understand it. Okay. What do you what do you think is next? I mean, as you look like your folks have passed, you've you know had these other folks that have died in your life, people that are close to you. Does it change how you do things? Is it does this mark a changing point for you at all? Do you think? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of my time and energy was spent with um, you know helping my parents and staying connected to them because they needed it. You know, they needed it. I made a commitment. Um, I don't know, maybe 15 or so years ago to call them once a day just to say hello and right. tell them I love them. Just, just as a way to, you know, um, make amends for things that I maybe I did when I was younger and just, just be a kind, uh, you know, attentive son. Even though it was just, hi, I'm calling to tell you I love you, I got to go. But I did it almost every single day. That's fantastic, so, by the way. I, I, I need to do more of that. Yeah, it's – and there were – there were days I didn't want to do it, and then I would say to myself, "Oh, come on, you got you got a minute, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, uh huh, you do, yeah." So I did it. Um, and there were times there were conversations that I didn't want to have that I just mm -hmm. was quiet and listened. Doctor Ruth says the same thing about sex with your partner. And she's still around. She's in her nineties. She's like, "You've certainly got two minutes to give your partner a little something," you know. And, and not just that all the time, but like, there's no reason to go for extended periods of time. But what do we, what do we do as a norm? We're like, uh, oh, you know, I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm angry. I'm, yeah. you know, there's a hundred reasons to not do. It. And it's like, no, wait a second, you know, spend some time investing in the person that you love. Well, you know? just even listening to well, things that you've heard you, 600 times <laughs> that you're not interested in at all. Why are you listening to me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm totally. Like, this, this again? <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah yeah that's funny so what is next i mean like how do you how do you take those the lessons like calling your folks once a day seeing the f people transition on and your life moves on without them i mean how do you what are you what are you doing what's exciting to you well what's what's exciting to me wow you know what's exciting to me isn't what it used to be it's not excitement okay um and you know what's exciting to me is being less reactive to outside things, to meditate more, to wear life like a loose garment, to work on those things, that's exciting to me, uh, a certain level of comfortableness and contentment. I'm not saying laziness and apathy or anything like that. Right. I'm saying just feeling, focusing on 
the limited time that I have, mm. enjoying more moments in a simpler way. Uh, I'm not that successful at it all the time. <laughs> Sometimes I am. Um, but it's a good thing to, to try to be successful at. And even if you're not where you think you ought to be, you're probably setting the bar too high anyhow. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to not be as uh, neurotic or get ups- as upset, take things personally. All those things that, uh, you know, I w- wasn't taught how to do that I know to do now. I'm pra- trying to practice them. Okay. I'm also excited about the podcast. That's a fairly new thing in my life, you know, and I right. get to talk to really interesting people doing really cool stuff. So, yeah. a- as you know, because you're doing the same thing. I, it's incredible that the conversations that you get to have with people and and what, I mean, for sure, sharing it with the world. But I do this, be- and this is what I've learned. I didn't do do this to start, but... I do it and I do it more than ever because it's just so enriching. I just want to spend my time doing it, you know, because bottom line, it's connection. Yeah. And if we're not connecting to other people, uh, why are we even doing any of this? Right. No, absolutely. I wanted to ask you this because it's, it's one of the things we've come across here in Hollywood as writers, people in the the art of telling stories is uh, so a guy, that sponsors the show quite often. His name is Jeff Calhoun. His company is called We Fix Your Script. And he helps people fix their script. He helps them understand it. Like everybody's got a movie, everybody, at least one, if not 10 in their head. But how do you get it from your head on on someone's table? That's a huge journey. And so, you know, he does a number of things. He does like he gives us time into workshops. He does consultations for free and all that kind of stuff. But he also makes his money like saying, I just want you to do not these nine things. Now let's put them in order. And he guides a person through. And if they want him to do the whole thing, he does the whole thing. But if they want to do it, he'll sort of be like their sensei. You know, I'm like, this is focus here. What is this person learning here? You have to turn this here. I need some irony here, you know, and helps the person figure it out. They're called We Fix Your Script. But why why would there be people that have made it in this town on story? And I mean, like, not people who run a writer's room, but people who are executive producers, showrunners. Why would they be so hard on that discipline? Like, why not just let someone see if they've got the chops? And if they've got it, I mean, that's the talent that Jeff brings is legitimate because you hear him talking you're like, wow, yeah, there's no doubt. This guy knows what he's doing. But why would there be any negativity towards that? I mean, you know, you know, this town, you know, writers. Why, why is that? You think there's negativity toward what he does? Yeah. Yeah. People are like, what? no, that's you're, you're making money off of people that have a dream or something. You know, and they right. should learn how to do it themselves or something like that. Yeah, well, yeah, but you, I, I don't agree. I mean, I'm stammering because I'm sort of shocked by that. Um, you know, uh, I kind of learned on the job. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was lucky enough to get a job off of being a good stand-up yeah. writer. Right. So I was my first writing job was basically doing jokes for, uh, on, uh, on a sitcom. Sure. And then I learned how to do the other stuff while I was there. So somebody was teaching me. Yeah. I was get- someone someone was paying for that. And somebody else was yeah, I wasn't paying them. I was <laughs> yeah. I, I was getting paid right. to, to do one thing. Yeah. But I went, "Oh, I better learn this other stuff." Mhm. Yeah. Um and there's books. Sure. But there's nothing like another person going you know, it, it's a faster learning curve. Sure. Having a person do it. A book is linear. And hardly anyone thinks that I, way. I think people learn more, uh, ex- I can't even say the word, Exper- experientially. <laughs> I like it. I like you. Ha- Is that the word? I can never say it. Experientially. Experientially. By yeah. by doing. Right. Yeah. Like if ne- I don't have a, like a block in my brain for the saying that word. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know. If the person is not good at what they do and they stretch it out just to make money, that's a different thing. Mm-hmm. Somebody who actually is going, L- I can help you. Yeah. And uh, people I mean, are happy to pay them if it's helping them. I, I mean, mean, this what, is the thing. Like, Jeff does so many free workshops. And, like, I say 15-minute consultation. If I'm honest, you know, he does way more than that because he wants, he wants the person to succeed. You know, like, and then he also helps get – it's like, you should put this in a competition. I've got competitions that I'm partnered with. I've got people that are like, any script you send me, I want to read it because you don't send crap. You know, so like access to that, that's valuable. That's totally worth it for yeah. somebody that wants to, to totally. do that. I mean, there's a lot of ways to 
to uh, you know speed it up. Mm -hmm. That that would be one of them. I would assume if the if Jeff is good, which it sounds like he's oh, very yeah, he's good. good. Yeah. There, there's some value in that. I mean, they yeah. there, co there's college classes at UCLA that sure do, do that. Why is, is something wrong with that? You can pay UCLA. Yeah, <laughs> but really, I mean, yes, doing it is the key, and doing it again and again and again. You're not going to get good at anything by just taking a class. Right. Right. But if you have a if you have a talent, now I don't know if he says to people, you don't have. No, he's honest. You don't have a fucking clue, and yeah, you know. Go well, do he won't do else. that. He's not. He's not that kind of a. Yeah, I mean, uh, I wouldn't do that either. Yeah, he's not, not that kind of a cr critique guy or a critic. But he will say, "Here's where you need to work," and there's that's always the case. There's always it's, it's never done, but you can always say this needs work. This needs work. This needs work. And if the person can do that work then their script will improve. I would submit this in its current form. You want me to tell you where to put work in? I would put work in. You know, he can. you can do that in a positive way because um, how many people in this town were told you fucking suck and you'll never do this? Yeah. And every, they're standing there everybody. with a golden statue in their hand, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, so, so that's proven to be not an accurate, you know, d description for someone. Like, yeah, I don't know. Why not? Tell them where they need to work. Yeah. Did you ever read that letter? I think it's probably a real letter. Hmm. I saw it on Facebook, <laughs> so it might not be. Yeah. It's a rejection letter to Einstein for his Jesus. relativity theory yeah. for his thesis. Yeah. It's too it's too abstract and it's not based in it, yeah. uh, in, in enough of this and that. So we we're very sorry. We can't accept your thesis. <laughs> there's a, a, a lady. I hope it's true because it's such a great letter to read. Oh, no. There's another story just like that. There's a lady who wrote a, a very powerful book on, on nur nature versus nurture. And basically saying, you know, as parents, your role as a nurturer is pretty insignificant and we can't scientifically find it. Okay, maybe it exists, but no one's been able to prove it. And so she wrote that. It's pretty inflammatory, you know, because all these folks are like, you can improve. Like, no, nah, you can't prove that, you know, because I mean, look, you've got three different kids in the family, three different outcomes. So, you know, how powerful was your nurture ability? And she uses actual like studies and science and because she's not siloed she was outside the industry working at that level the phd level but she wouldn't have a phd how come because uh the guy let's say his name is bob nickman bob bob nickman from harvard goes you know what you're just not cut out and she was early on so a woman graduating there was a big deal yeah and like you know you're not cut out for it you probably need to go on we're not going to grant you a degree so goodbye gives her a letter signed bob nickman well she writes this book the book is and she got it and she was sick. She wasn't like kind of a shut in. Like she wasn't able to leave the home because of her illness. And so she wrote textbooks. And so she got smarter and smart and did all of the work she wasn't allowed to do and wrote the textbooks for the people that were going to do all the work. So she's like, I took to all these pieces and I realized I can't write these, these bullshit books anymore because they're not right. Because if this is true and this is true, how can this be true? Mm -hmm. So she wrote her book and she won a huge award. And that award was called the Bob Nickman Award. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah, the guy that told her to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like, wait a second. You know? So, yeah, when people tell you, no, you can't do it, shit, why not hire someone like me? Fix your script. Like, people say all the time, like, I've got an idea for a script. I'm like, well, stop what you're doing. Call Jeff. It's free. Call him. If you have an idea, call him. You know? I've got a book and I want to write a script. Then you should, you should talk to Jeff because he's going to knock down barriers for you and, and make it so that. You can't go any faster. If you suck, you suck. And if you've never written a script, guess what? You suck. Well, you, know? you have to write a really bad, terrible first script and right. make every mistake that everybody makes. Yeah. You have to do that. You have to. There's no way around a terrible yeah. first script. There's no way around it. So write the bad one. Get it out of the way. When you see a bad script, and I don't know how many really rookie scripts you get but how many words do you have to read before you're like i'm not reading another word not because i don't like you but because i know what's i know what's in this and it's not good enough less than five pages right yeah it's, it's fat and, and a page is not like a page of a book it's there's not a whole lot going on but like by the first page certain things have to be set up and if they're not set up you have to right. know the rules to know that you're breaking the rules on purpose right and you can see the crispness and or, yeah. or the you know you can see maybe Oh, that you know they've, they're setting something up that's really interesting. Um, there's some technique. I mean, there's a lot of things you can see pretty quickly. 
And then there's all the sort of rookie mistakes, you know. A lot of people get enamored with, you know, a cool scene idea. You know, the guy's going to walk in and uh, there's going to be 20 people in chairs and none of them are going to have heads. Well, that's a really <laughs> great image. Yeah. But it's not a script. It's just it's just like, okay, you got a cool, you know, maybe it's about a killer that does that. But now what? Yeah, what's next? Yeah. <laughs> like all of the... Um, when you watch a Deadpool, so clever. There's so many jokes, and it's just really great. And those guys clearly work really well together when they write, you know. But it's it's not about the big, huge scene. It's the stuff in between that has to be good too, you know. Yeah. Like, don't make me sit through a bunch of nonsense because you had these five great ideas. Right. Well, it's uh, you know, why do I care is really the question. Oh yeah. How do you get? How, how, what are you doing that's going to make that person in the audience? Care. I had a friend who used to, he had a, a little piece of paper on his computer screen mm-hmm. that was dot, 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 and what's the audience doing while all this is going on? Yeah. <laughs> Just to remind him, this is, what, this, is what is, this is what you're trying to do. How often do you consider other perspective, the audience perspective, someone else in the scene's perspective as you're writing something, and does that influence how you... Yeah, of course. I'm always thinking about, um, well, I always think, character first Mm -hmm. i'm like who is this person what do they want what are the obstacles i can put in their way to get it and then from there what's the minimum it takes to beat make a character for you like i need to know where this guy went to college what color shirt he's got on or what is it it's more of an emotional thing for me okay Um, you know um i just try to like feel who this person is okay it's empathy really uh gotcha you know uh usually it's based on something that i've experienced it doesn't just come out of nowhere right right okay i interrupted you so no i I was just thinking about you know any characters i've come up with you know they always have some sort of a a hook to them that people can relate to right are they you know somebody who is irreverent is that their main feature everybody can relate to that everybody's got an irreverent side oh this guy's saying what i would love to say but i can't or, I, you know, or I'd go to jail if I did what this guy did, but it's a character, so you can, you know. So maybe that's the... I think everyone's got sort of a, a main uh, feature of who they are, personality-wise. And they also experience everything else. So let's say the character is irreverent. That's okay. their main feature. Right. What is an irreverent person like when they're sad? What is an irreverent person like when they're angry? What is an irreverent person like... When they're in love. Yeah. Okay. So that's still their main feature, but they still have all the other colors of a human being. I think about, I'm barely big on YouTube. I've now mentioned them twice in this episode, but, but Bono's ability to look at love from all these different angles, like there's a core love, but there's all these different spherical points that come in, like this version of love, the mirror of that, where it's love, but it's dark, you know, all these kind of things. And I think about how do you how do you find these different perspectives for that specific emotion? Because if you just say love, that's not good enough. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so then I think like who what kind of moments are good practice moments to like reveal an emotion or like a, an array of emotions? And then what's too much? And I'm going to get somewhere with this. But when I, th- I think about this, I think about someone like George Bush the Younger. You know, he comes into office. It's like a status quo presidency. You ran Texas well. Okay, run the country the same way. We'll be pretty stoked. We'll, we'll be excited about that. He's like, hey, we got a bunch of money. Everybody take some money back. Let's just get rid of this surplus, put it back out to you guys and spend it and go crazy. We're going to keep on doing this. And then he's in an elementary school reading books and someone, you know, Scott Card whispers in his ears. <laughs> and his face just, <laughs> holy shit, the whole world just changed, you know, and like, how do you capture that? Like, what is even that? What do you can't even call that an emotion? It's such a. You're talking about 9-11? Yeah. It's yeah. like a, not just a plot twist, but it's like a plot loop the loop with a double twist in the loops. And, you know, whatever he thought he was going to do, man. And then uh, the guy, Andrew Oak, the first ladies man, was talking about Lady Bird and how she was at the Johnson Ranch. You know, the people were prepping for the barbecue they were going to have with Kennedy in a couple hours. You know, like and someone's pissed off because the, you know, the, the sweet corn isn't right. right. And all of a sudden, I'm like, you probably could still go to that kitchen right now and pick up the jaws off the floor because they were all just right. 
waylaid by that. What are we going to do with all this potato salad? Yeah, <laughs> God damn it. I told you he doesn't like red pepper. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Wow. You know, and so how do you, as a rider, do you need moments like that to kind of play? I mean, that, that's, that's, if I was a rider, I, I would think about those things. And like, that'd be like my gym. Like, how do I get powerful at creating emotions? Like, how do I describe that emotion? It's so impossible. Yeah. I mean, you need those things and certainly for writing big drama, yeah. you know, those big events that spin the story in a whole new way. Right. You know, it's, uh, and, you know, it's just, it, I always want to know, is it believable in some way? It could be outrageous. Right. But is, is it, is it something that could really happen, uh, if it isn't, don't I, I would say don't probably don't do it. So how far can the audience jump with you? It de- well, it depends on the genre. I mean, oh, that's but, true. But yeah. if you're basing it on on some kind of reality, it's, it should be you should not be able to shoot holes in it, right? Uh, for reality, if it's some sort of a crazy fantasy, even that is based in something real if it's good. Yeah, like a lot of the movies that are roller coaster rides where you're just like impossible, impossible, impossible. You have to you're not suspending disbelief because you believe it's real. You're suspending disbelief because it's fun. And well you know. that's yeah, that's a roller coaster ride. That's right. a whole other thing. I, I don't enjoy most of those but myself for that very reason. Right. Here comes King Kong. Oh and T Rex. Oh Jesus Christ and a panda bear. And like <laughs> man, this is crazy. Well, it never it's comic stops. Bo- it's comic book stuff. I just it's just not my thing. Other people love that stuff. So let's go back full circle. So you've lost a bunch of folks recently. Your dad among them, your friend. Who who were the other three? There are other friends. Yeah. Uh just you know, I'm hitting that age, I'm sixty four where I'm I'm losing contemporaries, which I now that's considered extremely young in the 60s you know yeah used yeah. to be f- fairly common i kind of look at it like well let's say i live to be my dad's age and i'm i'm 64 he was 95 i'm in the last third how do i want to do that sure do i want to spend it spinning in my head the way i've been doing for x number of years about different things um i certainly feel like I let, I like to work, I like to do cool stuff, but I'm not like driven ambitious. Okay. Like I was when I was younger. And the reason I was was I thought it would fix something that wasn't right. I know that it's not. So now it's just a thing that I do that I enjoy. Right. Rather than I've got to get from here to there, then I'll be happy. Um I'm not as jealous of other people, that kind of stuff. Not to say that I don't have moments, but of course I do. Yeah, but uh, yeah, you know. So it's just a different thing. I I, I don't know if maybe it's a drop in testosterone. You think that's part of it? <laughs> I think it's a combination with yeah. all those things. You know, lessons learned. We've got on the show. His name's Doctor Bob. He's uh, he's like the Neil deGrasse Tyson for classical music. Basically, if I was mm-hmm. going to unfairly characterize, because he's actually older than Neil, so Neil would be like the Doctor Bob. But um, you know, he's like he's in his sixties, and he's like I, I figured it out right around sixty years old. This a couple of years back, I'm like, if you still figured it out, he's like, oh my gosh, I'm still figuring it out. You know, so if we're all figuring it out again, how are we being so hard on ourselves? It's okay to continue to figure it out, and you struggle with different levels of things, but. It's all right to like, I don't know. I keep changing my mind on what I know, and you know, you know the standard thing. Like the more I learn, the, the less I know. And uh, the other thing I think about a lot is, is we sure have access to a lot of information, but that doesn't give you access to wisdom. No, what's information doubling at a rate now that's accelerating? Apparently, yeah. Um, if it took a hundred years to double our information, and then it took maybe fifty, yeah. Now it's like an hour. (laughs) Yeah, it's really fast. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so it's not about knowledge. It really is about a mastery of of emotions, of empathy, of culture, of all of those things. Don't you think? Yeah. And I found a lot of it comes from uh, a lot of the the joy is sort of um, comes from uh, helping other people, which is not my default setting. I have to, you know, really sort of work at that. Um, there's a selfishness that I think most human beings are sort of have, yeah. you know, a friend of mine used to do a joke about if a, if a baby could, it would strangle you for a cookie. 
<laughs> I think the same thing is true for a cat. Like if that cat was 50 pounds bigger, it would kill you yeah. all the time. <laughs> like, I don't like this. Yeah. Man, you know, we've been going for 72 minutes. So we, we ought stop. to just, yeah, we ought to just chill out. Plus it's post lunch. We're probably yeah. going into that. Yeah, we're getting into that. We're putting the audience to sleep mode. But I really appreciate it, man. Like I want you to feel always welcome to come on the show. Uh, whether I invite you or not, invite yourself. Just say, oh, hey, come on, let's okay. do one. Yeah. Because uh, the thing I've learned about doing this is that the more perspectives, the more people, not necessarily like only 20 people in the room, but like the more you and I can share moments with somebody else, you know, it's, it's like exponentially increasing my experiential learning. And uh, I know the audience gets a lot out of that, too. So I hope they do. I hope that yeah. you have your, your, your uh, listeners uh, enjoy what you do because it's really important to, to bring out these different perspectives and get, get to hear what other people think. Yeah. Yeah, and there's no doubt that that's true. And it's such a different media, let me be fair, a different media than what we're used to on TV. Point, counterpoint, co- point, counterpoint, seven minutes done, commercials. Point, counterpoint, point, like, ah, no hyperbole. Let's just talk about where we really need to get to, you know? I'm not solving racism today. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a cappuccino and see if we can't just get calm so we can get some clarity, gather some perspective, do less, but do it better. Let's ask the listeners when this is over and you shut it off. Mm -hmm. Sit in a chair for five minutes and just be. Yeah. Try that. Can you do it? (laughs) Turn your phone off and just go, I'm just going to be like a little kid again. I'm just going to sit here and just be. Let's try that, podcasters, uh, listeners. (laughs) I'm not going to do that, but I want you guys to do it. (laughs) (laughs) Bob Nickman, everybody. Thanks, Pete. Thank you.